Today's video is another compilation of some of the worst mountaineering tragedies we have covered on this channel. From high altitude rescues, dangerous ski descents, Mount Rainier's deadliest accidents, and the most controversial disaster of 2023. We go through it all. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And as always, viewer discretion is advised. Mount Rainier, a 14,410-foot volcano, is considered the deadliest peak in all of North America. As of 2022, more than 400 people have died on the mountain, and there are very few years in the volcano's history that are as dark as 2014. It became one of the deadliest years in decades, and yet to this day, we still don't know exactly what happened. But six climbers lost their lives. This is their story. Mount Rainier is the tallest mountain in Washington state and the most prominent in the United States. It is the centerpiece of the more than 235,000 acre Mount Rainier National Park, which is a two hour drive southeast of Seattle. This park is more than 97% wilderness with the remaining 3% being the National Historic Landmark District. Each year, about 2 million people visit the park to sightsee, hike, or throw snowballs. But for those adventurous enough, they come to Mount Rainier to climb. More than 10,000 people try for the summit each year. All routes require ropes and crampons. As the most glaciated mountain in the contiguous United States, Rainier boasts more than 35 square miles of ice and permanent snowfields. Because it is a volcano, it stands alone, dominating the Seattle skyline. And because it is so visible from the city, it often attracts first-time climbers who have stared at the snow-capped peak for many years. There are dozens of routes to the summit, but about 80% of climbers travel via the southeast facing Disappointment Cleaver, which, despite having to navigate steep and glaciated terrain, is the least technically demanding of the guided routes to the summit. There are four other routinely guided routes on Mount Rainier. Emmons Glacier, Cotts Glacier, Fuhrer Finger, and Liberty Ridge, which is the hardest. The Liberty Ridge line slashes across the mountain's north face like a scar, intriguing and deadly. Climbers approach through Glacier Basin, crossing the Winthrop and Carbon Glaciers, before ascending the steep fin of the ridge to gain Liberty Cap. The terrain is steep dark rock and slick blue ice, and climbers called the line bold and striking. Most teams on this route descend via one of the more straightforward routes, which means climbers carry all their gear up and over the mountain. The ridge is almost always climbed in the early part of the season, May through mid-July, because risk increase as the snow and ice melt. As the glacier softens, rock and ice fall become increasingly hazardous. Even the smallest chunks of ice, if dropped from a thousand feet above a climber, can be deadly. The route is exciting, but known to be incredibly demanding physically, as it is 5,000 feet of vertical climbing on Rainier's heavily glaciated north face. Hanging over most of the route is the Liberty Cap, a glacier that regularly sheds ice down the mountain. Guides describe the trip as a grueling five-day trek. Participants carry 50-pound packs up 50-degree slopes for as long as eight hours a day. One brochure warns clients, you need to be in the best shape of your life. Because of the route's challenges, it is held in high regard within the mountaineering community. While the Disappointment Cleaver route has been nicknamed Disney-style mountaineering because of the overcrowding, the Liberty Ridge does not face the same problem. On Liberty Ridge, the only other human beings a climber sees are usually the members of their own party, and their efforts yield panoramic views of Rainier's most dramatic features. But it comes at a cost. Of the 10,000 climbers who attempt Rainier each year, fewer than 200 climb Liberty Ridge. That's less than 2%. And the route accounts for 25% of all climber deaths on the mountain. In 2014, Alpine Ascents International, one of the premier mountaineering guide companies, were set to complete an expedition on Mount Rainier's Liberty Ridge. Alpine Ascents, or AAI, runs expeditions to Everest, Aconcagua, Denali, 
Kilimanjaro, and more peaks throughout the world. They're known as one of the most established and respected companies in the business, so it only made sense with their background that they would be attempting an ascent of the most difficult ridge on the most dangerous mountain in North America. The expedition would be made up of Eric Britton Kolb, a 34-year-old finance manager from Brooklyn, New York, Mark Mahaney, 26, who worked in IT in St. Paul, Minnesota, Uday Marty, a 40-year-old vice president at Intel based in Singapore, John Mulaley, a 40-year-old Seattle native who worked at Microsoft, along with guides 38-year-old Matthew Hedgeman and 28-year-old Eaton Green. Matthew would be the lead guide, as he had climbed Rainier more than 50 times, while his counterpart Eaton had established new routes in the Alaska Range, skied off the summit of Mont Blanc, and had had been guiding expeditions since he graduated in 2009. The Alpine Ascents team set out for the Liberty Ridge route on Monday, May 26, 2014, expecting to finish that Friday, five days after their start date. Monday and Tuesday went smoothly. As the group climbed, there were no issues or even delays. On Wednesday, the six climbers would be spotted at Thumb Rock, a landmark on the route formed by hardened lava at 10,700 feet. At 6.20 p.m., one of the guides called the Alpine Ascent's office on a satellite phone to report the team was making camp for the night at 12,800 feet. They were all doing well and everybody was in good spirits, although they were aware that a storm was starting to blow in. Two clients sent out text messages that were received by friends, neither of which causing any alarm. At about 7 p.m., one climber texted a photo of the Wednesday night camp to a friend, which was later shown to Alpine Ascents. Out of nowhere, I get a photograph of this camp, and it's very structured camp, says Todd Burleson, Alpine Ascents founder. I can't see around it because it's white out, but I see the ridge it's on. It's on a nice platform. They've got three tents set up. Another member of the team also sent out a message from a spot tracking device at around 7.45 p.m. That was an indication of an all okay signal that included a GPS locator pin, which put the camp somewhere between 12,400 and 12,800 feet. Now this area was not usually a spot where expeditions would stop to rest, but it didn't raise any major concerns for the Alpine Ascents team. Although the biggest conundrum is that the group should have been above the Black Pyramid, one of the deadliest sections of the climb. But Burleson would state, you know it kinda doesn't make sense. I can't quite figure this out because there's no place that looks this good at the top of the Black Pyramid. There was no further contact from the team. On the last Thursday in May, an unguided party that had reported seeing the Alpine Ascents team earlier in the week reached the summit via Liberty Ridge, but saw no further signs of the missing climbers. When the group failed to return on Friday, Alpine Ascents called the authorities. That same day, two rangers who happened to be on the Liberty route were asked to summit the peak, following the route taking pictures or searching for anything that could point towards the missing climbers. They found nothing. On Saturday, a search helicopter made a low pass of a nearby cliff face that was 3,000 feet below the last location the climbers were spotted. The helicopter was searching an avalanche area at 9,500 feet when they detected signals from six avalanche beacons. Some gear and destroyed tents were also visible in the debris. The zone was a funnel that receives ice and rockfall from several highly active avalanche chutes leading down from the summit, so it was deemed too dangerous to attempt a ground search. Something happened on Wednesday night. Nobody can know with certainty, but the most likely scenario is that rock, snow, or ice fell from above and swept the team off the ridge, tumbling the group over 3,000 feet down the mountain before coming to a stop, then being buried, there was no possible way anyone could have survived. In August, three bodies were recovered by helicopter and were later identified as three members of the expedition. The remaining three bodies were left on the glacier as there was simply no safe way to recover them. The location makes it impossible to attempt an extended ground rescue, so they are simply at the mercy of the mountain. 
Charlotte Austin, an experienced climber, guide, and most importantly, friend to those that lost their lives, would speak with Eden Green's mother after the accident, to which she would state, We can only pray that they were asleep in their tents when it happened. Green's father, a financial risk manager, told Austin that his son had discussed ways for guiding and services to improve their bottom lines by improving compensation and benefits for guides. Austin would also state, Climbers like to talk about assessing and mitigating risk. Interacting intimately with risk is part of the appeal of operating in the mountains. When you are face to face with the potential perils and personal reward of each action, there is no room for complacency. In the mountains, we put ourselves in some degree of danger, but we also feel alive. We breathe in the sunrise, we use our bodies to their fullest extent. We communicate precisely and with intention. When I watch climbers lace their feet into plastic boots, adjust their crampons and take the first trembling step, I believe that I know what they are thinking. Is this risk worth the reward? That answer varies. Some climbers summit, others turn back to camp, regardless of what happens in the Alpine though. Climbers are all but guaranteed to return to sea level with a better understanding of their own personal risk-reward matrix. Eighty meters is all that separated Gina Marie Arzacidlo and Tenjin Sherpa from the summit of Shishapangma and history. 2023 became a race for two American women, Gina Marie Arzacidlo and Anna Gutu, to summit all 14 8,000ers and become the first American woman to accomplish the feat. Both these women and their Sherpas are all incredible mountaineers, but their test? was Shishapangma, an intense 8,027 meter peak. Migma G, one of the greatest climbers of our generation and leader of the Imagine Nepal team would say, it was a horrible expedition. I didn't expect it would turn out like that. Everything was going smoothly, but the competition between these two ladies ruined everything. This is their story. Before we dive in, I just want to point out that this tragedy is still very recent, and different accounts of the events have been released periodically over the last two weeks. Our sympathies go out to all the family members and friends that lost a loved one. Arza Sidlo and Gutu were both incredible climbers, but they had very different backgrounds and experiences. While pushing for the final summit, they each were aware of the other and what was at stake, and many believed this is what caused the story to end in tragedy. Arza Sidlo, a 45-year-old from Auburn, Massachusetts, had been climbing for years, and her goal to reach the pinnacle of all 14 8,000ers was a multi-year plan. She climbed Everest in 2018 and K2 in 2022 before taking on Lhotse, Cho Oyu, and Nanga Parbat in 2023. She was described as extremely uplifting and funny. Her infectious laugh could get the whole room smiling. Gutu was almost the complete opposite of Arza Sidlo. She was a great climber and athlete, but the 31-year-old had no climbing experience in the Himalayas, so she would partner with some of the most famous and accomplished climbers of our time, Elite Exped. Elite Exped is run by three climbers, the famous Nimzdai Persia, Migma David Sherpa, and Migma Tenzai Sherpa. Their mission is to deliver tailored guiding experiences on the world's highest mountains. All three climbers were a part of the first team to stand on the summit of K2 in the winter of January 2021, and they were perfect for what Anna Gutu was looking for, a partnership that could support her inexperience with sheer grit, determination, and raw climbing skills. The race to climb Shishapangma actually began on another 8,000er, Cho Oyu. Both climbers would be on the peak in late September, with Arzacidlo reaching the summit on October 1st, and Gutu reaching the same mark just a day later on October 2nd. Gutu would post a video to her Instagram, capturing this moment in celebration of reaching the summit, and this would kickstart the feud. Up until this point, the race to summit the peaks was described as strong, but not toxic. After reaching Shishapangma, the conflict just began to get worse, with Arza Sidlo calling Gutu the Instagram climber due to her lack of experience in the Himalayas until 2023. After returning to Cho Oyu's base camp, Arza Sidlo left the peak right away, while Gutu was delayed by local authorities and then had several problems with their yaks. 
Although there is no proof, team members were suspicious Arzacidlo might have encouraged the officers to stall the second team in order to delay Gutu's transfer to Shishapangma. In order to get Gutu there in time, they had to leave their duffel bags of gear and supplies behind, bringing only enough gear to climb the peak. Tracy Metcalf, a friend of Arzacidlo, would state, I think that Gina was very interested in being the first US woman to complete all 14 peaks. She was surprised with how quickly Anna was able to climb them. While Arza Sidlo was traveling to Shishapangma, she stopped in Tengri, where she wanted to hire a faster Sherpa than the ones provided her by her current outfitter. She managed to bring on Tenjin Sherpa, who was in Tibet guiding for seven summit treks. Tenjin was the powerhouse who helped Kristen Haralia summit all 8,000ers in just over three months and shared her record. I have an entire video covering Tenjin and Kristen's expeditions, so be sure to check that out after this one. The main reason why this change in Sherpa is important is that it was unclear who Arza Sidlo answered to and who had the authority to turn her away from the climb. Shishapangma is actually considered one of the easiest 8,000ers to climb. You can actually drive up to base camp before making the climb to camp 1 at 6,400 meters. From camp 1, you climb a 40 to 45 degree slope to camp 2, then a 10 to 15 degree slope to camp 3 at 7,100 meters. This is where the real climb on the peak begins. Just like most mountains, you leave camp 3 between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m. and climb a 45 degree slope to the summit. The main risk here is avalanches. In fact, climbers are typically climbing on a fixed line the entire trip. Gina Arza Sidlo set off before the elite exped and imagined Nepal team reached the mountain, but stopped at Camp 2 because there was no open trail and no ropes. The joint team of elite exped and Imagine Nepal reached Shisha Pangma's base camp on October 6th and started right away. They hurried to Camp 1, planning October 7th as their summit day. Uta Ibrahimi, also on the mountain, said both Gina Arzacidlo and Anna Gutu were on oxygen when they arrived at Camp 1. It's very unusual to use oxygen this low, especially on 8,000ers, but it is credible that both wanted every advantage in the race to the summit. Meanwhile, beyond Camp 2, a Pakistani climber, Nali Akiani, would state everybody seemed to be waiting for us to break the trail and fix the ropes. It was really hard going for us. It was only us breaking the trail, and it was exhausting. More people came only after five or six hours. As dawn broke, they were approaching the upper slopes of Shishapangma. Like most teams in recent years, they didn't go for the classic route that followed the long, sharp summit ridge to the true summit. That is because it is a two-hour climb along a knife's edge where one wrong step can leave you tumbling hundreds of feet down the peak. Above Camp 3, they deviated toward the main summit wall in order to go up one of the snow couloirs. They aimed to reach the summit ridge as close as possible to the highest point, or at least that is what most did. Anagutu's group, well ahead of everyone else on her team, deviated from Camp 2 toward a point on the ridge. It is important to note that Gutu's team leader, Nims Persia, was far behind as he was climbing without supplemental oxygen. Meanwhile, Arzacidlo's group was a little below on a different line, but climbing fast. There was no fixed rope, but Tenjin Lama took the lead with two axes and pulled Arzacidlo with a rope. They were climbing at a remarkable speed, climbing around many of the groups standing on the slopes. This video shows Arza Sidlo and Tenjin climbing in the distance. Gutu climbed the peak in a diagonal line, directly toward the summit, while Arza Sidlo chose a line going from left to right, across a gentle slope that had to be traversed. Most climbers follow Arza Sidlo's line, as Gutu's line was not the true summit. Gutu would eventually realize she was going in the wrong direction, because at about 7,700 meters, they stopped for an hour, then they moved up the slope again. Then, the first avalanche happened. Nims would shout at the group below, Avalanche! Avalanche! The climbers on the slope above Camp 3 heard powder snow roaring down the peak, with many taking cover behind large seracs. The radios would erupt with chatter, and before long the news would break that Gutu and her Sherpa were in a direct line of the avalanche. A rescue operation would begin immediately as climbers began digging through the snow looking for any sign of Anna and her Sherpa Mi'kmaq, but it didn't take long before they found the body of Mi'kmaq. This video shows climbers combing through the snow, 
just 20 minutes after the avalanche. A famous climber and Sherpa, Migma G, almost lost his life while helping with the rescue operations. While helping a fellow climber untangle a guideline, he would slip and fall nearly 150 meters, trying to stop his slide twice before finally coming to a rest on a rocky surface. He would be found unconscious and not breathing, but the quick action of another climber who performed CPR on him saved his life. He would return to Camp 2 that night covered in blood, but alive. This is how dangerous the conditions on the peak were at the time. It was unclear if Arzacidlo and Tenjin had heard the news that Gutu and Mi'kmaq were caught in the avalanche, as they were on a different radio frequency due to the competition. They certainly saw and heard the roar of the snow. Several sources on the mountain claimed that base camp did tell Arzacidlo to stop and turn around, but the climber refused. She was under the full effects of summit fever. Summit fever is when a climber becomes obsessed with their goal to reach the pinnacle of a peak. They forego any danger or concerns, instead pushing through any conditions to accomplish their goal. Arzacidlo was 80 meters from the summit of Shishapangma when the second avalanche would occur. There is little information on exactly what caused the second avalanche or accident, but both Arzacidlo and her Sherpa would lose their lives on the upper slopes of the mountain. Obviously, this would spark controversy in the mountaineering community, with many climbers blaming summit fever and the fierce competition being a catalyst for the accidents. Would the avalanches still happen if the teams were working together? Maybe. But the circumstances and speed the climbers moved up the slopes would certainly have been different and just may have led to a different outcome. What if we took the challenge of climbing the tallest mountain in the world, but made it even harder? Well, that's exactly what 30-year-old Tomas Olsen did. A team under the name The Vikings Are Back traveled to Tibet in the spring of 2006 with the aim of summoning Everest and descending by skiing off the mountain. Tomas would be part of this group, but wanted to take the challenge a step further. There have been individuals who have successfully skied down Everest before, but nobody has done it following the most dangerous route possible, the steep north face. This is his story. Tomas Olsen was born in Sweden in the 1970s, and by high school had a pretty good idea of what he wanted to do with his life. Being from Sweden, the popular sport is skiing, and Tomas instantly gravitated towards it. His college years were filled with various ski trips, and it was at this time that his love for climbing also began. After graduating in 2001, Tomas moved to Chamonix, better known as the location of Mont Blanc, where he devoted himself to the sport and became a professional extreme skier. Multiple times throughout the years, Tomas would travel to exotic locations to explore and test his abilities. Most notably are his descents of Aconcagua in Argentina, Peak Linen in Kyrgyzstan, Mustag Ata, Kuksai Peak in China, and Cho Oyu in Tibet. But none of these accomplishments could compare to what Tomas was determined to attempt next. Instead, he had an idea, a crazy idea, to stand on the summit of Everest and ski down the North Face, otherwise known as the Great Norton Kular. In terms of difficulty, this route is much more challenging to traverse than almost any other route on Everest. It is one of, if not, the sharpest inclines on the entire mountain. Those familiar with the area claim that a fall, if not halted by a rock, will likely end in the deep white snow at the base of the mountain. To put it in perspective, in the history of Everest, there has only been one successful summit following this route. Keep in mind that the men would only need to descend on skis, as their ascent would be following the much easier Mallory route. Now Tomas knew that this would be no easy feat, and so with this idea in motion, he began training his body and mind for the journey. From many miles of cycling to multiple summits of Mont Blanc and hundreds of ski descents, Tomas spent a full year doing everything he could think of that would help him achieve his goal. In the spring of 2006, he was finally ready, but would not be making this journey alone. Norwegian friend and professional skier, Termod Gronheim, accompanied Tomas, as well as photographer Frederick Schienholm 
who would be watching from afar. The men would reach Everest from the less popular Tibetan side and spend the next month making the necessary preparations. Multiple acclimatization trips were completed in order for his body to grow accustomed to the altitude. Passing snowstorms caused various delays, but would not deter the men from their goal. Eventually in May, it was time. Olsen and Gronheim set out for the summit on May 14th from advanced base camp at 6,400 meters. All the weather predictions show that there would be some varying storms, but nothing too major that would prevent disruptions from their climb. There was a constant fog that sat on the mountain, preventing visibility to about 100 meters in any direction, and this would cause some delays, but ultimately not prevent them from climbing. Their first day proved to be a huge success and was spent climbing fast. So successful, in fact, that once they decided to make camp, they were already a full day ahead of schedule. The men pitched their tents with the sun still in the sky and rested, preparing for an early morning. They woke up at around 11 p.m. that same day, noticeably colder than earlier, when Tomas exited his tent. He could just barely make out the sky filled with clouds, and the realization of what was to come began to set in. Both men looked at each other, took a deep sigh, quickly ate their breakfast, and set out on the mountain right before midnight. They made excellent progress scaling Everest at a very fast pace. There was little noise on the mountain, other than the wind or snow crunching under their boots, and even fewer people, as the Tibetan side had much less traffic than the approach from Nepal. After a few hours of climbing, the sun began to rise, but was hardly noticeable as the clouds sitting above the men began dumping snow on the mountain. Their visibility was limited to about 40 meters in front of them, and they had to focus on working as a team if they were to continue. As you can imagine, the storm greatly slowed their progress, but surprisingly their spirits were high, so they kept moving. Both men had spent many months preparing for this trip, and they were determined to reach their goal. Step after step, rope after rope, they scaled the tallest mountain in the world. The wind constantly blew snow into their covered faces, providing no reprieve from the cold. They could see little around them, and at times questioned if they were even heading in the right direction. But every once in a while, a key feature on the mountain would stand out, indicating that they were on the right path. There was little time for thought or talk. Instead, they just kept going. After 14 hours of battling a fierce snowstorm, both men broke out into smiles as they stood on the top of Everest. Because they set out so early, it was only 1 p.m., but the storm had required them to exert more energy than they had anticipated. Tomas was highly optimistic, but made a side comment to Tormod, expressing that he hoped they had enough strength to ski. Their ascent becomes even more impressive when compared to others, as it only took two days for the pair to summit, when on average the Mallory route takes five days to reach the pinnacle. But as every mountaineer knows, the climb up is only half the battle. For Tomas and Tormod, their real challenge was only just beginning. Luckily, the weather had turned for the better, and there was no longer a storm obstructing their visibility. After a few minutes of enjoying the view, the pair took the skis off their backs and strapped themselves in. They set off at 1.20 p.m., and within minutes covered 200 meters and were already on the balcony. Tormod led initially, and Tomas followed as the second skier. After the balcony came a narrow and steep gully, which they skied down until stopping at a snow patch on a cliff located above the rock band, which also lies on top of the Norton Kular, the most dangerous section. They moved fast, but on their way down to this location, Tomas heard a crack and noticed it was more difficult to control his left ski. Once the men had stopped to plan out their next move, Tomas looked down at his equipment and cursed. His left ski was broken behind the binding, and this meant serious trouble for the pair, high on Everest's unforgiving north side. Both men became slightly stressed from the situation, but did not panic. Instead, they attempted to repair the ski with duct tape and climbing gear. It was nothing fancy, but they were confident it would hold until the ski was no longer needed. They assessed their location and realized they would have to rappel down the cliff they were on before being able to ski. However, being in a snowfield, they failed to find a rock to use as a belay point for their rope. So instead, they were forced to make their own solution, which involves using two snow sticks and one ice axe as anchors. Considering that Tomas had broken his ski, he proceeded to strap himself in first and rappel down the cliff. Tormod watched from above as he moved 10 meters down, then 20, and 30. Then all of a sudden, 
the anchors gave way, causing Tomas to plummet approximately 10 meters down into the Norton Goulart. Tormod tried catching the rope as it fell, but it was to no avail. The fog prevented Tormod from seeing what happened to Tomas, almost like he disappeared in a cloud, and when he yelled, he received no response. Tormod knew he now had to descend, but did not trust the anchors or rope to hold him anymore, so he looked for anything that he could use as an anchor. To make matters worse, his mask had stopped working, and he now had to continue without supplemental oxygen. Termod spent an hour searching, trying different tactics, but at this point, it was 5 p.m., and he had to move. So instead of using a rope, he decided to free climb instead. Termod skillfully scaled the rock, and once he reached the bottom, he saw no signs of Tomas anywhere. Even his gear was nowhere to be seen. Now this section of the mountain is really where the incline began to be a problem, and many climbers claim that it is so steep a fall will continue for thousands of meters, unless halted by a rock or ice axe. Termod did not spend much time debating or even thinking about what happened. Instead, he focused on descending to get himself out of harm's way. He skied down the Norton Coulard, but on his way down, spotted something out of the corner of his eye. He approached the object and got a better look, only to find out it was Tomas's ice axe and crampons. Notably, however, there were no indications of Tomas attempting to stop his fall. Not wanting to pause for long, Termod took a mental note of the location. Instead of continuing the difficult route he was on, he transitioned his way over to the North Ridge, which was a much easier path, and continued to ski down the mountain. The excitement was completely gone, as Termod could only think about the snow in front of him. He would make it safely back, and although his accomplishment was something to be proud of, the mood was immensely sorrowful as those at camp learned that Tomas would not be returning. Because there was no sign of stoppage, it led those to believe that Tomas lost consciousness when he hit the snow from his fall, and thus just continued to roll down the mountain as nothing was there to prevent his momentum. Within a week, two Sherpas had found Tomas Olsen dead, and about 2,500 meters down the mountain, from the location of his tragic fall. His body was located in a heavy avalanche zone, so the Sherpas lowered him 300 meters out of the danger area and left him for the night. They returned the next morning with proper assistance and successfully recovered Tomas on Everest. Tomas Olsen dedicated his life to skiing down some of the highest summits in the world. He was a professional and true athlete and one that was determined in his goal. But on Everest, a series of events led to his tragedy, further emphasizing, further emphasizing that on the mountains, it does not matter if you are prepared, a beginner, or an advanced climber. Sometimes, bad things just happen. David Gottler looked at his partner Kazuya Harade as they stood on the northwest face of Amadablam, an incredibly difficult and technical mountain in the Himalayas. Harade had snow all over his face and looked exhausted. The pair had just slid 10 meters down the steep slope after they were covered by an avalanche. They were lucky they were still alive, mainly thanks to their climbing ropes wrapped tightly around their waists. They were attempting to climb a brand new variation of a difficult route up the northwest face, but the snow conditions above 6,450 meters were making the climb impossible. They had minimal gear on their backs, as they were climbing alpine style, which means they were climbing with as little gear as possible, as they chose speed over long-term survival. It is the purest form of mountaineering. Both David and Kazuya looked at each other, accepting that they wouldn't be summiting the peak. But as they started to descend, they encountered large seracs and cliff faces. The problem was the pair did not have the correct gear to descend. They could no longer retreat or advance. They were trapped. Their only hope was a Nepalese legend, helicopter pilot, Sabin Bosnia. This is his story. After David and Kazuya realized their mistake and the reality of their situation began to set in, they would stop to rest on a small coal on the ridge. There was just enough space to set up a bivouac, and that is where they would both rest, pull out their satellite phone, and ring their agent in Kathmandu, requesting a helicopter rescue. They were told that a rescue would be attempted, but because of the weather and time of day, 
he would have to wait until the following morning. The duo began to feel uneasy as the sun fell behind the ridge and darkness shrouded them. The winds would begin to pick up and this worried both David and Kazuya because they both knew that if the weather continued to be difficult, it would be nearly impossible for any rescue to take place. Luckily, the wind dropped the next morning, meaning a rescue would be possible. There was a large serac or giant block of ice below them that was large enough for a helicopter to land. They knew that this would be the area they needed to climb to. Kazuya would fix a rope to the top of the lower serac using a snow stake before climbing onto the ice. While both climbers were exhausted, they had exceptional experience in the mountains. Both of them had been climbing for years and knew they had to remain calm in this situation. So they waited on the large serac with a lump in their throats. Early morning on November 7, 2010, Sabin Bosniat was going through his pre-flight routine from a small airport in Lukla, Nepal. His flying partner and technician, Pernal Wally, sat next to him. It was a good morning to fly. There were light winds and clear skies, and as Sabin took off from the small airport, he began to feel calm. He had been dispatched to rescue two climbers stranded above 6,000 meters on Amadablam, a mountain that was less than 16 kilometers away from Everest. Sabin's literal job was life and death. He was a pilot and co-owner of Fishtail Air, a private aviation company created specifically for Himalayan mountaineer rescues. He had over 6,000 flight hours and was considered one of the greatest pilots the region had ever seen. He was a part of the highest ever rescue mission in spring of 2010 when he piloted his chopper to 21,000 feet on Annapurna's Camp 2, saving the lives of three six Spanish climbers. By 9 a.m., Sabin was piloting his aircraft slowly towards the north face of Amadablam. Anything above 6,000 meters is considered a high altitude flight, but this was a normal day for Sabin. Even still, he flew slow and steady as the major danger was the thin air. The higher he flew, the thinner the air became, which makes the rotors of the craft less efficient, and eventually they wouldn't be able to generate enough lift. And then, well, he wasn't going to reach that altitude. Sabin and his partner also had oxygen masks over their faces, as it was easy for the thin air to make him lightheaded if he did not receive enough oxygen, and that was a recipe for disaster. While David and Kazuya waited on the large serac, they saw the faint black dot on the skyline that approached them from the east. It got closer and closer, and they both released a sigh of relief as they realized it was a rescue helicopter. As Sabin got closer to the ridge, David and Kazuya watched as they inched the helicopter towards the Serac. Because of the thin air, the aircraft moved back and forth a sign of the difficulty of flying in the high altitude, but Sabin would land the chopper on the ice after a few minutes of battle. Because of the altitude, Sabin could only fly one climber off the peak at a time, so David and Kazuya would turn towards each other, share a few words, then put up their hands in front of their bodies, facing each other. They would decide who would get off the peak first, just like any normal adult, with a game of rock, paper, scissors. David would eventually win, and it was decided Kazuya would stay on the slope, but would keep all the supplies with him. Hopefully, it would only be for an hour or so, but you just never know. David would climb up and into the helicopter before giving his climbing partner one more glance as Sabin maneuvered the aircraft off the mountain and back into a safe altitude, eventually being dropped off in a nearby village. From the village, David would watch as he could see the entire north face of Amadablam. He couldn't help but pull his phone out of his pocket and begin filming, thinking he could share the video with his friend later, both having a good laugh of relief. Soon the helicopter was approaching from the east and hovering above Kazuya. The gap from the Serac to the aircraft was roughly 30 centimeters, but as Kazuya looked on, he couldn't help but have an uneasy feeling in his stomach. Instincts told him that it was too dangerous to get on board, and his delay may have just saved his life. Kazuya would hear a loud bang and then a roar and instantly watch as the chopper began losing altitude in front of him. He was stunned and could only watch as black smoke billowed out. He smelt the overwhelming scent of oil and to his horror, the helicopter fell down the face of the mountain. Miraculously, Kazuya would be unscathed. Small piles of fallen snow were the only remnants of the chopper that was flying a few meters away from him seconds earlier. Kazuya didn't know it at the time, but Sabin, in his attempt to rescue Kazuya, had flown too close to the ridge. 
and his main rotor had struck the side of the mountain, instantly disintegrating the metal blades and sending the helicopter into a free fall for over 5,000 feet before crashing into the side of the mountain, instantly killing Sabin and his partner Perna. But Kazuya's story was not over. He was still stranded on the side of Ama Dablam, and his chance of rescue was now gone. His only option was to re-pitch his tent and wait, hoping that there would be another rescue. As the sun fell, it was difficult for him to sleep, but eventually he would start to fade in and out of consciousness. The next day at 7 a.m., Kazuya, wide awake, began to hear another helicopter engine approaching. As it got closer, it hovered just a few meters away, but Kazuya, waving his hands around, signaled the Serac was not a safe place to land. The pilot would fly several circles around the area before signaling a flat area nearly 50 meters below Kazuya. He instantly understood. Exhausted, but pumping with adrenaline, Kazuya would grab a nearby rope and begin descending the peak with his gear. About 15 minutes later, he would reach the flat area, where he would climb into the helicopter and off the mountain. Helicopter accidents have unfortunately become a common occurrence in the Himalayas. Even in 2023, six lives were lost due to their chopper losing control on its way to Everest. And there are countless stories of more accidents throughout the last decade. Some chalk it up to pushing yourself beyond your means, knowing someone can bail you out, but it comes at a cost with rescues operating at 2,500 American dollars per hour. There is no mistaking that with many inexperienced climbers on the mountains, there are increasing scenarios where an air rescue is necessary. After the incidents, David and Kazuya would both continue climbing, with David going on to accomplish many difficult summits and eventually reaching the pinnacle of Everest with no supplementary oxygen in 2022. Many times we speak about the dangers of the mountains and those that climb them, but we must also recognize and acknowledge the dangers others put themselves in to save those in their darkest hours. The bond between brothers is not easily shaken. But what if you were faced with an impossible choice? To leave your brother on a deadly mountain and save yourself, or stay to help with little hope that you last the night? Three men were presented with this exact scenario, and the result is something nobody could have predicted. On December 28, 2012, David Reinhardt along with twin brother Eric Norse and Greg Norse were settling in for the night, 6,700 meters high, on Mount Aconcagua. Completely unaware, the next 24 hours would change their lives forever. This is their story. Eric and Greg Norse had a special relationship. Like all twins, early in life, they were naturally competitive with each other. They would always be best friends and looked out for each other, lending a helping hand when the other was in need. Nothing could come in between them. The Norse brothers attended Oregon State University in the late 1980s and through a fraternity were introduced to David Reinhardt. Within two minutes, the three men were friends. It was just one of those relationships that instantly clicked. It also helped that they all bonded over a shared hobby, extreme sports. For the next 23 years, the trio would spend numerous nights under the stars together, forming an unbreakable bond. They would travel to many places like the Alps, Denali, or the Andes in South Africa, and were not known for specializing in one specific activity. Instead, they were more so the guys who wanted to do everything from rafting, scuba diving, skiing, snowboarding, fly fishing, mountain biking, hiking, and sometimes even hunting elk. In 2004, the trio even took a two month long motorcycle trip through Mexico. Whatever the adventure was, they always planned for it months in advance. In 2012, this was no different. Eric, 41 at the time, had a successful flooring business in Greenlee, Colorado, and was excited for his next big adventure with the group. After summoning Denali twice already, the trio felt like it was time to move on to another peak, and so they chose Mount Aconcagua in Argentina, one of the original seven summits. The seven summits are the highest mountains on each of the seven traditional continents and provide an intense challenge for those brave enough to attempt each peak. Aconcagua is the tallest mountain in the South American plate with the max elevation reaching 6,961 meters or 22,838 feet. 
Eric had always been a risk taker, and his wife was well aware of this, but something about Aconcagua just did not sit well with her. Normally, Eric would be excited and ready for his next adventure, but on this trip specifically, his wife saw something that she had not seen before. He was nervous, which in turn made her nervous. When asked about what was on his mind, Eric replied, It's the weather. It gets brutal and it takes lives. Aconcagua on average is not considered a technical challenge to climb. In fact, following the normal route, which is an approach from the north, it is actually the highest non-technical mountain in the world, meaning the path to the summit can be traversed without ropes, axes, and pins. Of course, there are more challenging routes that will require some technical skills one can opt into. Knowing the type of people that the Norse brothers and Reinhardt were, they chose to follow a more difficult route up the mountain called the Polish Glacier, which is a 40 degree gradient that runs along, you guessed it, the Polish Glacier. Despite how non-technical Aconcagua can be, it still has the highest death rate of any peak in South America, which has earned it the nickname Mountain of Death. This is mainly due to people underestimating the dangers. Standing at 6,700 meters high, there is still a high risk of altitude sickness, as well as many other common mountaineering uncertainties. Greg and David, having very successful careers of their own, both resided in the Portland area of Oregon. So when it was time for their journey in late 2012, the pair would meet up with Eric, who was in Colorado, and from there fly to their destination. Argentina. By December, they were on site and preparing themselves for the climb. They would have no outside assistance or guidance and would solely rely on themselves. It is common for mountaineers to perform acclimatization trips before climbing Aconcagua, so I imagine the trio had to at least know this, but I can find no record of them performing such trips, so I honestly cannot say for certain if they did or did not complete all the necessary preparations before attempting the summit. They did not start their summit push until the very last week of the year, so as you can imagine, the temperatures were cold. On average, it would be negative 25 degrees Celsius, or negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. The beginning of their climb was great. The sun beat down on them from above, as there were no clouds in sight, and wouldn't be for a few days. The dry air caused the men to have chapped lips, but they would quickly forget about this nuisance as they cracked jokes to one another. Eric would take the lead first, it would be the more enthusiastic one out of the group, gently pushing his brother and David along. It was easy for the men to enjoy themselves. They had each other, all doing what they loved, and had an amazing view. With each step, they felt farther and farther away from the worries and stress of the busy lives they left behind. By Thursday, December 27th, the three men had reached high camp, right around 5,852 meters, or 19,200 feet, and settled in for the night as the sun set. They were tired, but knew they needed to be mentally prepared for the next day. The hardest part of their climb along the Polish glacier would be tackled in the morning, and if they were successful, then the summit would follow. In mountaineering, timing is very intentional. Many climbers will start their summit push very early in the morning, as this will not only allow them enough time in the day to safely return, but without direct sunlight, the snow will become more compact and therefore safer to traverse. This is common no matter what peak you are on, and the trio knew this. The men woke up that Friday by 3 a.m., huddled together in the freezing temperatures, wishing for more warmth. After a few minutes and some stretches, the excitement began to build. Each of them could feel it. It was summit day, and there was no other feeling quite like it. They took about an hour to get ready, got a bite to eat, and gathered up their equipment before starting their day at 4 a.m. After high camp, the route they were following greatly increased in difficulty, more than the Norse brothers or David could have predicted. The terrain transitioned to mostly ice with little snow for traction. The incline was also steeper than anticipated. Up until this point, they really had not used their ice screws or axes, but certainly needed them for this section of the traverse. Relying on their crampons to hold their feet, one wrong move would send a man tumbling down the mountain to his death. Because they failed to spot the difficulties of the Polish glacier, the men did not bring enough supplies for longer ice climbs, so instead each section took much longer than normal as they had to reuse supplies. As you can imagine, this was also a very tiring process, and before long the sun was well in the sky marking midday. 
The excitement that was felt earlier was entirely gone. Instead, each man was intently focused on the task at hand, and they knew the risks were higher than before. Each successful section completed only led to another one that needed to be traversed. After a few more hours of this, frustration was building, and the sun began to set. Eric and Greg still appeared to be in good health, but David was rapidly declining. It was harder and harder for him to continue, and soon the Norse brothers knew something was wrong. David showed signs of developing altitude sickness, and it was progressively getting worse, so much to the point that it was hard to even keep moving forward. Altitude sickness can occur when ascending too rapidly, which doesn't allow the body enough time to adjust to reduce oxygen and changes in air pressure. To make matters worse, because the ascent route they had taken was covered in ice, it would be almost impossible to descend following the same path. Instead, they needed to reach a higher point on the mountain and shift to an easier route before climbing down. Additionally, their location made it not viable for rescuers to provide the necessary help needed for their situation. To put it bluntly, they were stuck. Either they continued to the summit and descend following an easier route, or they stayed where they were in freezing temperatures with little protection against the weather. Eric, realizing the situation they were in, told his brother, I will go to the summit and come back with help. There was little arguing, so Greg hugged his brother and watched as he turned his back and began scaling the ice. Greg would not sleep that night. He stayed awake to keep David warm and to monitor him as best as he could. For the first hour or so, he watched his brother climb, one foot after the other, until he was about 200 meters away or 600 feet. At that point, Eric had stopped moving upward and instead focused on finding a path down. When he was unsuccessful, Eric turned to the north face of the mountain, which in the dark was challenging to see, but it was a steep cliff. This decision slowed Eric's descent massively. Greg, on the other hand, patiently waited, listening to David breathe. Luckily, the sky remained clear, and there seemed to be no other immediate danger. Hour after hour would slowly drag by, as Greg wondered where his brother was. Eventually, the sun was rising, and ten hours had passed since Eric left. Greg could not wait any longer. He decided that he had to find help himself. Doing the only thing he could, Greg strapped David to the ice wall as securely as possible. Then he began to climb the mountain in the daylight, not mistaking the route like his brother did. Soon he was nearing the summit, and decided to wait on a highly traversed route to catch the first climber of the day. While he waited, Greg would pull out a satellite phone and make an emotional call to David's wife, who would then go on to alert the proper authorities, triggering an emergency response in Argentina. Greg waited for two and a half hours before a climber finally appeared before him. From there, he learned the best way to go down, and for the next six hours, descended Aconcagua. Greg would make it back to high camp, exhausted, but there was another problem. His brother Eric was nowhere to be seen. Greg would be worried, but he was certainly in no condition to be of any help, so instead he was tasked with resting and a search party was sent out. Miraculously, 90 minutes later, Eric walked into camp with a smile on his face, limping and barely conscious. EMTs administered basic first aid, told him not to fall asleep, and actually advised him to keep climbing due to the oxygen content in his blood being dangerously low. Porter, stationed on the mountain, offered to carry the men's gear down, but Eric, being the man he was, would not accept this. Since he carried his gear up the mountain, he would carry it off, and accepting anything less was admitting defeat. Eric, feeling exhausted, decided that he would take a quick nap before continuing the descent, despite being warned not to. He threw up his tent and settled in. Only a couple minutes had gone by before EMTs were trying to wake him knowing he was in danger. They shook and shook him, but it did not matter. Eric was unresponsive. Emergency workers noticed his heart rate dropping, and they began CPR in hopes that he would wake up. But alas, it was not meant to be, and Eric would die on Aconcagua. The medical classification was a pulmonary edema. Fluid had filled his lungs, and there was no chance of survival. David's family would learn about the news and coordinate a recovery. His brother flew out to Argentina and met up with Greg while an investigation was ongoing. It would take two and a half days for rescuers to retrieve David Reinhardt's body on the glacier. Rescuers were dumbfounded when they found his body, as he was 150 meters higher than where Greg had left him. Like most of the stories I cover, this one ends in tragedy. Three men, brothers in life, and wanting to enjoy the outdoors, took on Mount Aconcagua excited, ready for the challenge. They had experience with extreme sports, 
and we're not beginner climbers, but when you are in high risk situations, sometimes it just does not go your way. All three men knew this. Their loved ones would go on to state they loved the outdoors, they loved each other, and their families. They came down here for a great adventure, and it unfortunately didn't go well. Rick Allen took a 500 meter fall after an avalanche. Many thought he was going to die. He lay in the snow as his head was split open, but he simply smiled at his rescuers and through his blood crusted mouth said, I am not dead yet. Rick was a man who had looked death in the eyes multiple times and smiled, nicknamed the best UK mountaineer that no one has ever heard of. He is most famous for his legendary and world first traverse of the 8th Summit Bazino Ridge to the top of Nanga Parbat. His climbing partner, Sandy Allen, and Rick would take 18 days to make the journey, while only having 10 days worth of food. At the age of 68 in 2021, Rick would be climbing K2, attempting to summit through a new route, but the Savage Mountain had other plans. This is his story. Rick Allen is not a man of many words. He would only speak when necessary, and even then it was rare to hear more than five words out of his mouth, but he certainly was a man of action, and somebody who enjoyed a challenge. Born in 1954 in Bridge, Scotland, he developed a strong love for the mountains after multiple family vacations to the English Lake District. Rick would attend Birmingham University, where he would take up rock climbing. Early in his life, he would go to work in the oil industry, and his role allowed him to travel the world. It was during this time he began to develop his mountaineering skills skills, specifically using the alpine style. This climbing method is best described as the truest form of mountaineering one can achieve. You usually only partner with a small team or even climb solo. Survival skills are a necessity, as in most cases climbers only use gear that they can carry on their backs. The goal is to move as quickly as possible, with the more extreme traverses spanning multiple days in freezing temperatures and harsh conditions. Rick would fall in with a crowd of climbers in 1984, who were traveling to the greater ranges in the Scottish mountains in European Alps. Here he would make his first major ascent of Ganesh Himal II, a 7,034 meter peak. And by the time they were finished, the team had no more food or fuel left to spare. Rick's first major break came in 1985, when he was invited to tackle the then unclimbed Northeast Ridge of the tallest mountain in the world. Everest. It was on this expedition that Rick would find his lifelong Scottish climbing partner, Sandy Allen. Although they were ultimately unsuccessful, Rick received invaluable experience on his first 8000er, including a solo bivouac in the death zone. Rick and Sandy would go on to make many ascents together. They would establish a new route on the south face of the 7,161 meter peak, Pumori. Bonding over the course of this journey, as many nights were spent huddled together in a small bivouac. Both climbers worked exceptionally well together. Some would say they had an uncanny ability to understand what the other would do before they did. They trusted each other with their lives, and this would lead the both of them to team up with Doug Scott on Everest in 1987. However, that year was brutal as snowstorm after snowstorm thwarted their attempts. They left that expedition as a failure determined to try again later. Rick's first big scare occurred in 1988, when he along with Sandy were climbing Makalu. Rick kickstarted an avalanche that swept him off his feet and he tumbled for over 500 meters before stopping. He had cut open his head and those climbing with him at first thought he was done for. As he was being rescued, he couldn't help himself but smile through his blood crusted lips and say, I am not dead yet. Rick would spend over 40 years climbing and I can go on and on, but this video would just simply never end. Just know, he continued to push the boundaries of what is possible in the Himalayas, although one climb would stand above all the others. In 2012, Rick and Sandy set their eyes on becoming the first men to complete the ascent of Nanga Parbat's Mazino Ridge, something that many famous mountaineers like Doug Scott had failed to do. The Mazino Ridge is the longest mountain ridge of any 8,000er in the world, estimated to be anywhere in the range of 10 to 13 kilometers long, meaning that to complete this traverse, a climber must physically travel over 10 kilometers under altitudes ranging from 5,000 meters to the summit of Nanga Parbat at 8,126 meters. A fall on either side would send you tumbling down for miles to certain death. 
Across the traverse, one must pass the top of at least four significant 7,000 meter mountains. They set out on July 2nd with a team of six in total, carrying enough food for eight days. 10 if they rationed correctly. They only had a week before the next storm would come in, but it was understood that to complete this traverse, you must climb through storm conditions, as you will never have long enough weather windows. By July 4th, the team was on the ridge with mesmerizing views from either side. Nanga Parbat's summit stood in the distance as their finish line. On day 4, a Nepalese climber experienced a fall of 40 meters, placing the group in a bad spot. Of course, they would provide rescue, but this event would set them back two days, as they had to climb down Biviak for the night, only to retrace their steps in the morning and spend the remainder of the day resting. The next day, a storm struck the group, and they were forced to take shelter after not making any progress. The next four to five days were spent climbing over snow and ice, making good progress on the traverse. The team achieved multiple 7,000 meter summits, mesmerized and appreciative of their view. However, this all came crashing down on day 11, when their food supplies were diminished with only scraps left. Rick and Sandy felt optimistic and decided that they would continue while the other climbers began their descent. The sky was misty as they parted ways, so they quickly lost sight of each other. The four climbers on their way down would survive two avalanches by luck, but ultimately would return safely. Rick and Sandy on the other hand took a rest day and then kept pushing. They made slow work as light snowfall and strong winds made it difficult to continue. They were struggling to keep their bodies warm in the knee-deep snow, but after two weeks of climbing, the pair began to recognize some of the key features of Nanga Parbat. The summit was within reach. They would leave their man-made snow cave early that morning, and after a grueling day of hard work, the duo would stand on the summit of the ninth tallest mountain in the world accomplishing something nobody had ever done before. During their descent, both climbers were exhausted. They no longer had any food or supplies and were completely on their own. Even the fixed lines were non-existent as nobody had been on Nanga Parbat for over two years at that point. The pair were inches from being swept away in an avalanche on day 16 and Rick was barely holding on. Thankfully, on day 17, they had reached the location where other climbers were stationed to help the duo, marking the end of the worst sections. Overall, the journey would take 18 days total, and the climbing duo would receive the Pilet d'Or, Mountaineering's highest honor. In 2018, Rick would give his colleagues their worst scare. As he was attempting a solo climb of Pakistan's Broad Peak, he would fall from an ice cliff while descending above 7,000 meters and almost everyone would presume that he was dead. However, just by chance, a cook in base camp spotted Rick's backpack against the snow. A drone was sent up to scout the area and spotted Rick on the peak, hanging on to his ice axe against the steep slope. This footage you are seeing is from that exact drone. Sandy would quickly jump into action and coordinate a huge rescue operation that would eventually reach Rick and help him descend the slope. All of these near-death experiences only modeled Rick to become the man he is, and his experiences are truly remarkable. But despite the risks, the mountains were an integral part of his life, one that he refused to give up. In 2021, at the age of 68, Rick would go on the attempt at the summit of the Savage Mountain, K2. He would be climbing with his good friend Jerry Gore as the duo was raising money for charity, Rick for Partners Relief and Development UK, and Jerry for Action for Diabetes, who was trying to become the first Briton with type 1 diabetes to climb K2. Both men were experienced climbers, although this would be Jerry's first 8,000 meter attempt. On June 21st, the duo started their trek to K2's isolated base camp, where they would have to hike over 110 miles through snowy mountain passes and glaciers. Over the next month, Rick would complete numerous acclimatization trips to prepare his body for the high altitude conditions. Even in the summer months, the weather on K2 is manageable at best. The freezing temperatures, brutal wind, and dangerous avalanches all combined for a deadly combo. A small weather window appeared in July, but Rick and Jerry were not yet comfortable climbing K2. Instead, they would attempt Broad Peak an 8,047 meter tall neighboring mountain. The day they set out was promising, but the conditions were deteriorating rapidly as the duo had to combat deep snow and random small showers only further increasing the difficulty. 
Before long, both climbers were forced to turn around and return to K2's base camp. After a few days of rest, the duo were finally prepared to attempt the Savage Mountain. The plan was for them to go up in a team of eight, although that would quickly change due to Rick. You see, before their climb, Rick was adamant about following a new route on the mountain's southeast face. So determined, in fact, he decided he would not listen to anyone telling him otherwise. Rick would make the ascent with two members of their group, while the rest of his companions were following the normal route up K2, the Abruzzi Spur. This route was only a few hundred meters away from where Rick was. All men would start their ascent in late July, and in all honesty, the conditions were still not favorable, but they were tired of waiting and felt like it was now or never. The sky was muddied with mist and snow as the group had some visibility, but not at long distances. For the most part, the temperatures were hot considering they were on K2, right above 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. During the first day on the peak, small flurries of snowfall were constant, which is a warning for all climbers, as loose snow means a high chance for avalanches. Overall, the day seemed uneventful, as Jerry and his group were making good progress, and Rick was equally matching them on his own route. It was not long before both teams were past Camp 1 and on their way to Camp 2. Time stood still. The sun was beating down on them, when all of a sudden, Jerry heard it. An avalanche kicked off right in the path of Rick. He was completely buried. Base camp jumped into action as a helicopter waiting nearby started its blades and flew to the location. The two men climbing with Rick luckily did not receive the brunt force of the disaster and were rescued quickly with no major injuries. Rick, on the other hand, was nowhere to be seen. Jerry and the rest of his companions returned to base camp that evening as there was little they could do besides wait. Rick was loved by all the men and considered a grandfather figure to most, so everyone, and I mean everyone, attempted to help. Men stationed at Camp 2 heard the news and descended quickly to advance base camp, where they drank warm tea, had a bite to eat, and set out for the avalanche location with shovels. The strong climbers moved fast and did not wait for the slower men climbing at an impressive pace, those below waiting anxiously for any news. By midnight, they had found Rick but he was no longer alive. His body would be wrapped in a tent for respect and flown off the mountain back to base camp. All the men that night huddled together in one tent to comfort one another before going to bed. At 6 a.m. the next morning, the men woke and stood together under the shadow of K2 in unity, saying prayers in multiple languages as a final goodbye before burying Rick in a mountain grave. On July 25th, Rick lost his life but many remember him for being a caring person that loved everyone and just wanted the best for the world. He led an extraordinary life. He was one of the world's finest mountaineers and touched the lives of many. His bold alpine style ascents in the high Himalayas will be remembered for generations, and his climbing partners would state that with Rick being gone, a void has been created, and he will be forever missed.